Today's May 29th, 2017. You're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 44. I know, because I wrote it down this time. We're covering this week's stories, some more news on the accuracy of wearables, measuring our health, some of the design trends of 2017 and beyond, and also, Dubai has a new Robocop police force. Human Factors Cast is the only podcast that covers your Human Factors news from a garage in San Diego, and it starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, happy Memorial Day to Nick and all the listeners. It is Memorial Day, and uh, just we don't take a day off, man. We are here talking about Human Factors stuff, and I, I, can't, I can't lie, man. I am super jazzed for this episode. We got so many cool stories to talk about this week. Some serious heavy-hitting stories. A lot of health, a lot of robots like you talked about in the intro. It's going to be sick. Oh my gosh, I'm so eager to talk about these. But first, first, I want to remind everybody that we are going to HFES this year. So please, if you see us, pull us aside, talk to us. We love that interaction that we get with you guys, our fans, our listeners, fans. That's that's really conceited of me. Our listeners. <laughs> it's a conversation. So let's have one. We'll meet you there. We're going to be in Austin. Let's do it. Also, man, Blake, so I got to tell you, man, so I was... I had a couple people over this week, and I just had an amazing experience that um, I would like to share with you and our listeners. What you got, man? So, have you heard of the Jackbox games, like, just in general? Okay, so no, I haven't heard of this at all. I see it in the notes, but I've never even heard of Jackbox games. Okay, so Jackbox, so you may have heard of the game, like, you don't know Jack. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you've heard of that one. Okay, so... Jackbox Games is the company that produces that game. And, uh, you know, they used to make board games, but they've recently sort of gone into this digital space. And I just want to comment on this. So they take advantage of the way that we interact with technology and kind of hijack that to encourage cooperation and, um, and encourage that everybody's focused on the game and not necessarily on... Uh, other things that are going on on their phone. So let me let me uh, explain to you the situation. So over the weekend we had a couple friends over, and um, and and we were playing this game called Fibbage. Uh, are you familiar with Fibbage? No, I am not. I'm assuming it has something to do with fibbing, though. It does. So let me break it down for you. So basically, what happens is you pick a category, and it gives you a que- uh, like a like a trivia question, right? And it's like um, George Washington was known to have seven of these or whatever, you know, and, and you have to basically fill in your own answer, right? Seven of these cherry trees or seven of these hatchets or whatever it is. And um, everybody fills in a fib. And if you get other people to fall for your lie, then you get points. And if you pick other people's lies, you lose points. But the way they do this, okay, so I was playing on the PlayStation 4, and what you do is you log in on the PlayStation 4, and everybody who who wants to play has some sort of device. So you have your tablets, you have your cell phones, you have your laptops, you even have, uh, you can visit on computers. And it gives you a website, right, which is like fibbage.com, and you put in this four-digit code that indicates what room you're in, and so everybody's on their devices, and uh, wait, wait, wait. You're, like across multiple platforms, like from your PS4, tablet, and phone, you guys were all playing the same place. You got it. It's just a browser. So everybody points to that browser. You put in the thing, and it hosts it on like a server, right? So, so everybody that is incredible. Okay. Dude. Holy cow. Yes, and I'm not done. So everybody's like playing on their own devices, right? And so everybody writes in their fib, and then. Like, it only gives you so much time. So if you can't think of a fib, you can hit, like, lie for me for half the points or whatever. Anyway, my point with this is that what happens when you're playing a game, right? Well, if you're doing, like, a traditional board game, maybe you'll make your turn and you'll go to your phone or device or whatever and you'll lose situation awareness of what's going on on the game. And with this, it happens so fast and everybody's using their devices in order to interact with this game. So there's not a chance for people to sort of go off onto other websites or to get distracted. Everybody's focused on the game. And man, 
I really have to hand it to these guys. I have only played the one game, but I'm assuming that like their whole game suite operates this way. And man, it is something else. Yeah, dude, that sounds incredible because now you've cut down on barrier to entry because almost everybody walks around with a smartphone in their pocket, so you don't have to worry about having multiple controllers and your kids using the PS4 or anything like that. So that's awesome, dude. Oh, man, I was completely blown away. This was one of those above and beyond examples of where I'm like, holy crap, this is is the future of how we're going to play board games. Like, I don't even want to buy any more physical board games. I I just want to buy this this whole suite, man. Like this, ah, oh, so good. It's so good. All right. Uh, do you have anything else to add on my story? <laughs> I don't. But man, I'm totally gonna check out Jack's Box, Jack Box Games. You know like, what? I I don't know. That seems like such an awesome concept to be able to be playing all basically in one browser room together and not have to worry about having a bunch of different pieces of tech like people came to your house to hang out and yeah. you're able to throw something together it's and so so great let me just comment one more thing the rhythm so everybody's like heads down in their phones picking their lies and then it's heads up and everybody pays attention to the screen because they want to know if their lie was picked or who picked what lie and then it gives a leaderboard it's so good man i gotta have you and elise come over and try it out sometime that sounds like a plan man all right well With that said, let's go ahead and move on to the news. We got a lot of stuff to cover this week. So this is the part of the show all about Human Factors news. Now, this could be anything from medical. We got some news in that this week. Transportation, that to artificial intelligence, virtual. Wow, we have like one of everything here. Automation design, you name it. As long as it relates to the field of human factors, it is fair game. Blake, what do we have up first? All right. So up first, we're talking wristbands and Fitbit type objects all right wearables so, what <laughs> so what can we learn about emotions the brain and behavior from a wristband well plenty according to rosalind pickard Los- rosalind and her team at mit pioneered the use of wearable tech to recognize changes in human emotion they've made several new discoveries including that autonomic activity measured through a sweat response is not as general as previously thought and carries more specific information related to different kinds of brain activity. Pickard's group has built an automated machine learning method that can detect compulsive seizures for more than 96% accuracy through a wrist-worn device. Future clinical applications for wristband electrodermal monitoring include anxiety, mood, and stress monitoring and measuring analgesic responses. Now, Nick, Nick, that was a mouthful of things, but that is pretty awesome that Again, we're seeing some wearable technology that is really bringing us more information about what's going on inside our body more than just heart rate. So, so you mentioned that you know we're kind of in this this weird zone right now where we're still kind of figuring out. I mean, we have the sensors on these wearable devices, but we're still trying to figure out basically where we stand with that. You know, what kind of accuracy do we have on these readings? Does it accurately measure? Uh, say say heart rate or can we extrapolate calories from that but they're with this study they're extrapolating emotion um, and and trying to detect sort of seizures right yeah like this particular one I guess they were able when it, when we we're talking about able to detect 96 percent with 96 percent accuracy I guess that's a specific type or having a specific type of seizure which is like a convulsive seizure but yeah basically it was reading your electro dermal response and then being able to i guess correlate that with how likely you were to have one of these seizures which is i don't know this is a whole different idea for wristband like measurements right because it's not really straight heart rate this is almost only what's going on on top of your skin related to like how you're sweating what your skin's like that type of stuff is yeah is is I uh I forget. Do they have a GSR on this thing, or is this just uh uh they they built this apparatus, right? They did. This is like a, a homegrown MIT piece of hardware. Right. I'm trying. To, I, I I bet they have GSR on that because I don't know how you would do it without that. Um. And uh, yeah. I mean, I feel like this is is one of those pieces that you kind of want to talk about with something else. So why don't we go ahead and get into the next story, and we'll kind of talk about these two together because they're they're really closely woven together, and I feel like it it kind of deserves attention on that scale. What do you think? 
Yeah, I think it brings a lot of question into the utility of kind of wearable devices. So let's just jump into this sure, one and let's kind of bring it all together. So Stanford inquiry, a Stanford inquiry into the accuracy of seven wrist activity monitors showed that six out of seven devices measured heart rate within 5%. None, however, measured energy expenditure well at all. The take-home message here of the study is that the that a user can pretty much rely on a fitness tracker's heart rate measurements, but base, but basing the number of donuts you can eat on how many calories your device says you burned is a really bad idea. The team saw a need to make their evaluations of wearable devices open to the research community so they can create a website that shows their own data. So they created a website that shows their own data. They welcome others to upload data related to a de- to their own device performance and you can find this through one of our links to this article uh but nick so this like shows a big contrast between what we're seeing as far as wearables now granted the first our first story talking about i guess looking at more the electrodermal response is from a wearable developed at mit for a specific research study right but this second kind of inquiry into different commercially open uh, wearables definitely brings to light that where they're good is heart measurements versus where they're falling short is trying to figure out how many calories you're actually burning or how much energy you've expended. Right. And uh, just to, so yeah, this is, like you said, this is commercially available versus something that was um, created specifically for the study. But they, they looked at the Apple Watch, the Basis Peak Fitbit Surge, which is, um, I'm not sure if that's the one I have. No, I have the like fancy... Uh, switched out with anything one uh, Microsoft Band Mio Alpha 2 Pulse on and the Samsung Gear S2 uh, I think it's really cool that they're uh, being thorough with this and uh, I, one thing I don't notice is Jawbone I don't know if they have a heart rate monitor or whatever but um, so so basically this is more confirmation that yes heart rate is is good um, but you know, take take these other measurements with a grain of salt because we still haven't figured out how that um, how that factors in. They haven't come up with the algorithms to uh, to to correlate them and and uh, and yeah. So, and I mean that even kind of makes sense because if you refer to the article from Stanford, I mean the way that they were actually trying to measure, um, I guess, metabolic changes was taking how much carbon dioxide and oxygen were in your breath. So if that tells you anything about how to determine what's going on metabolically as ter- in terms of energy expending or how many calories burned, it's going to be really hard to do that from just like galvanic responses or measuring your heart rate. So, I mean, right. I think it's going to take a little more like technical footwork to figure out how to make those things kind of add up. Because I think even one of them said that it was about like 20% 20, 27% away from being accurate at all in terms of calories burned. Yeah, and the least accurate, they say, was off by 93%, which is, uh, yeah, well, I mean, why are you spending your money at that point, right? Yeah, well, yeah, that, that's true. But uh, one suggestion I might give to listeners, and again, like, I'm, I'm no expert, but a good thing about, I guess, how much technology we have on us at all times is kind of doing a comparison between what maybe your phone will gather versus what your wristwatch can. Um, Because I've done that for a couple of different, just like trying to see what exercises burn the most calories for me and kind of doing a little comparison shows you that there is a big gap between what the two are measuring. Oh, yeah. um, And can give you an idea of like, okay, well, maybe maybe I need to go look online a little more about this. Or if I meet meet somewhere in the middle for both of these maybe i'm doing enough uh, but again it's going to take like s- some serious work on the technology side to get this to where people want it well yeah and i'm glad you said that too because i do the same thing i put on a walking app on my phone and i look at the calorie meter on the treadmill or elliptical or whatever i'm on and i have my fitness tracker as well so it's it's three sources and i use that source i, I use those sources to kind of average out where i feel like i am you know depending on how hard i work and It'll be great once we're there, but I I think that studies like this, uh, opening it up to the accuracy and efficacy of these studies, I think it's a step in the right direction. 
Oh, most definitely. And this really wasn't the focus of the article, but as far as from the Stanford inquiry one, uh, what I thought was really cool is that the, this concern is kind of rising because people are getting smart smart watches or Fitbits or tracking things on their phone, and they're trying to take it to their doctor and use it as data for it like their heart rate or the calories they've burned or try and right. like bring in some of their own data about themselves from the day to day to try and help, I guess, understand what's going on in their medical life. So I think it's a really big step forward for consumers. It's uh, it's like bringing us, bringing a scientist alternative facts. <laughs> Very true. Um, yes. All right. Well, I have no other closing comments on this, Blake. Well, all righty. You ready to hop into the next story? This one's kind of special for our I.O. listeners. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So for everybody that's into I.O. psych out there or industrial industrial organizational psychology, this one's for you. So according to a survey released by the American Psychological Association, American adults who have been affected by a change at work are more likely to report chronic stress, likely less likely to trust their employer and more likely to say they plan to leave the organization within the next year compared to those who haven't been affected by an organizational change. Workers reported having more trust in their companies when organizations recognize employees for their contributions, provide opportunities for improvement and communicate effectively with employees. Now this definitely all sounds kind of commonplace, but it's, it's interesting that this was taken from such a large pool of people and we get results from this guy. I think there was like 1500 people in this study. Oh yeah. Um, so I'm going to say two things. The first thing is going to sound offensive and I don't, Lay it mean, on them. I don't mean it. No, 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 no. I don't mean it to sound offensive, but this to me sounds like obvious information. And it's amazing how many times we just take something uh, as fact without any scientific backing behind it. Now, that being said, if you think something is fact and uh, and it's just kind of one of those things, maybe maybe it's, there's a study there. I don't know. I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. But for this, the interesting thing to me were the statistics, right? So they, they obviously made broad sweeping generalizations with the, um, you know, the uh, organizational change causes stress and trust is go, goes down with the employer and, um, you know, they plan to leave. But if you look at some of these stats, right, um, I, I, I feel the interesting part is more in how current employees feel about their job, right? So they say 78% reported average or better levels of work engagement um, in terms of energy, uh, being strongly involved in their work and feeling happy, right? So 78% of people feel happy in what they're doing. Um, and so that makes sense to me that if the company were to uh, institute this big change, then they would go, uh, what, what what's going on? Uh, one in five employees, 22%, reported low or very low levels of engagement. So again, um, those people who you know are not very engaged may... <laughs> Like I, I still feel like they, they'd uh, be upset if there was a change, but only if it resulted in a difference. Uh, what what else here? We got seventy one percent felt that their organization treats them fairly. So overall, it's pretty positive. And uh, just in general, like I don't know who who did they grab for these because it definitely wasn't retail employees. <laughs> yeah, and it's kind of interesting that like the the bigger stats that they pull together from the survey are overwhelmingly kind of positive things. Like, I mean, the people, as long as they're engaged in their job, which most people are, they feel good. It's this smaller percentage that don't. But I will say one thing that I guess bothered me about this, and this is a Science Direct article, so maybe, or excuse me, Science Daily article, so maybe there was more to the specific paper, and this is just a summary. Right. But when we talk about the change at work, there's no real... And I, I, this is just a stickler thing for me. There was no operational definition of what that meant. Right, or right. Or what that even could be. Uh, so it, it feels like there's just a wide range of variants for of trying to relate it to stress and trust and am I going to leave in a year, it really being equated to this change at work. Well, what was that change? Was it a problem 
with you and an employee? Was it necessarily related to your employer, or is it just kind of coincidence that it all comes together? Yeah, you know, um, I'm sh- I'm sure they mentioned it more in the actual article, but um, I'm trying to see here. Um, hang on, why don't, why don't you complete your thought here while I while I look this over? Yeah, I mean, I do. I get a little concerned when I see that there's these really big things like I, people are reporting more work stress. They just don't trust the people they work for. They're going to leave their organization. They're just not happy when we're talking about something that we can't really quantify as well, like a change at work. Um, and, and it's good to do these studies, get a feel for how people in our current economic climate are doing at work. How can we make it better? And it's always good to read that, people are more engaged at work and they're likely to want to stay. And this is like a smaller misnomer. Uh, but it's, it's kind of what they're going more after talking about is the negative aspects of it. Okay. I got it. So here's their operational definition. Uh, have you been affected by organizational change in the last year? So you're absolutely right. They don't, they don't go in and operationally define change, but that leaves it open. Like if, if somebody were to p- perceive change even though you know it might just be a slight policy change like um changing the way you track time or something that could be an organizational change right instead of spreadsheets you're now using chronos or um you know some other uh time management service that's an organizational change and to some people that might affect them if like let's say they were um HR or something who is taking care of timekeeping or, or payroll or something, right? So that could affect them differently than somebody else. So I, I think it's okay that they left it open, but I agree with you that there there may need to be some sort of clarification as to what change means. Yeah, or even breaking it down a little more explicitly into the types of change, right? Like if yeah. if they if these if like a, let's say a managerial change was more reflected in people being scared and wanting to leave the organization because they didn't like that change, or if it's something something like you talked about, just like a process change, how what does that equate with instead of kind of these bigger blanketed statements? But I still like to know how people are doing in the workforce, and although the I guess the title and what what we really get from the bulk of the article is kind of in the negative direction. What was great was that a lot of people are satisfied with what they're doing and they do feel engaged at work, at least according to this study survey. Yeah, I'm I'm looking more into depth here and it's just yeah, it's recent, current or anticipated changes affected by organization changes in the last year. Um yeah, there there's not any clarification on that. But this does open the door to say, hey, there's more research that needs to be done on the types of changes that may or may not affect your employees. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. Do you have any other thoughts on this? We got a lot of stories this week, so I, I want to make sure we have time for all of them. But this is definitely something like this art this uh this report is really cool and I encourage any of our listeners who are into IO psych or even just you know, if this piques your interest, go go check it out because uh, th- it's all really well done and they they uh, lay out everything for you. Before we move on, though, I want to uh, give a big thank you to all of our friends at the Next Web, Scientific American Transportation Research Board, Science Daily, and Stanford Medical for bringing us all of our news stories this week. And if you guys want to follow along with the stories as we find them, be sure to follow us on all our social media for links to the original articles. See, that was great. I said go check out this article, and then I said here's. Uh Here's where you can find them. All right, Blake, what's up next? Well, thank you, King of Segway. All right, so when we talk about innovation, the safety industry isn't necessarily always what first comes to mind. However, with the amount of technological progress taking shape on a daily basis, this is one of the fastest moving fields out there. The safety industry is about to get a major facelift with innovative technologies at the forefront. The next web put together a list of ways that the safety industry is changing through the use of AI and machine learning, better training modules, and wearable technologies. While the industry is heavily dependent on how fast we implement programs like robotics and machine learning, expect these to have immediate impact on the near future, especially as these programs start synthesizing together. Now, Nick, this was a really well put together article just kind of 
bridging the gap between what's going on in the safety industry and these big, uh, big, I guess, innovative areas in technology for AI training and then wearable tech. So I just want to get your thoughts here. Yeah, man, I can't say too much about the project, but I will say I am working on something that has to do with augmented reality and, and safety in particular. And um, yeah, there's definitely a necessity uh, for safety. And the way, you know, so so imagine you have uh, like AR glasses or you have, uh, and, and this goes into the, the wearable technologies, but imagine you have AR glasses and you're walking around a factory floor and you see potentially hazardous zones, right, that you might want to navigate away from. That's that's one way. I like like I said, I can't give too much. That's a tease. That's a tease. Maybe I can talk about it later, but I'm under NDA, so I can't say too much. But that's one way that I have personally experienced this, as well as the machine learning. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, right? With the with the um, oh, with the robotic arm that kind of gets the more sensor data from the surroundings yeah, and can interact. You can like have a human interact with the robot and not worry yeah. about them getting hurt potentially. Yeah, exactly. It 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 eliminates the need for humans to uh, work behind these cages, right? So I see all this, but to have this this article kind of bridge the gaps together and um sort of uh, lay it out in a way, I, I, the safety industry is something that I'm not terribly familiar with, um, and th- this was a great sort of introduction. What did you think of this one? So I I like I made the connection that you did with the the AI and the machine learning of course like we're getting a lot better sensor data we're we're actually giving these machines more data that they can make adjustments and not actually have to do too much interaction with a human operator but like we just talked about there is even the ability to bring a ha- human safely into the environment what I thought was great and it's sometimes something I forget is the ability to train people through I guess, e- what they call e-learning platforms. And similarly to what you just talked about with the augmented reality, which I feel like that's got a giant future in just training employees alike. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that was that was something I really hadn't thought about, and I'm glad that it, it's getting such a spotlight in this article. Um, but, I, it, but I think the more immersive those kinds of tools get, the better, they're, the better off they're going to be, especially for these industrial areas or in safety, trying to deal with, um, different specific in- instances. Um, and we've talked a lot about wearables this this week and in the past weeks, and I think that this has only got to be a great thing for people, especially in the like service industry, such as like road workers or anybody for the Department of Transportation that has oh, to yeah. be out and about, like really know, trying to gather a lot of data on how healthy you are during the day. Are you getting overheated? Is your heart rate too high? I feel like there's a lot of impact to be had with wearable tech. Yeah, and, and you know, sorry, one of the things that you were saying there kind of sparked my memory. Uh, one of my colleagues is actually doing research with an, um, an electrical uh, power distributor. And um, they, so one of the most common causes of death is falling. Right. And so that is also another thing. And that goes into the training. Right. So how do you train people to not fall? (laughs) And it's like I can't get too much into it because he'd kill me. But uh, yeah, that's another thing. So I don't know. There's applications everywhere. It's just where you look. Right. And, And we have a ton of smart people working on this stuff. So, you know, the future is bright, I would say. Most certainly. And speaking of the future, we've got a, our next article is about teenagers and using their devices. You want to hop into it? Nick? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So as we all know, teenagers are spending a lot of their time on digital devices, and it tends to be wreaking havoc on their physical and mental health. But a recent study published in Psych- Psychological Science suggests a moderate level of use is not necessarily harmful and may even be beneficial. The effect on the effect on well-being varies depending on the type or medium type of device or medium, such as TVs, TV and movies and video games, computers and smartphones, as well as the day of the week. The optimal amount of exposure peaks at around one to two hours daily during the week and longer on weekends. So limiting your teen screen time is fine, but consider the benefits before you pull the plug entirely. 
Now, Nick, I feel like this has implications for a lot of us to to yes. think about one way or another because, I mean, it's we're talking about the optimum amount of exposure that's okay. I mean, I know we're not all growing teenage minds, but being around one to two hours, and I I know that I sit at a computer for a lot longer than that and definitely interact with my sm- smartphone throughout the day. Yeah, and let me – so this is one of those articles, listeners, that I want you to actually go and look at because this graph – is really something to marvel at. If you look at this graph, and I'm I'm looking at this, and and I've mentioned it on the show. I'm a video gamer, and uh, so this makes sense to me, right? Zero hours of any like any digital content. Our world is changing, and so if we're completely cut off from that, obviously some people are built for that, and they love that disconnection from technology. But for most of us, we at least need some sort of interaction, and it looks like at no interaction, you're not that happy. And if you get that one to two hour range, you're happy and you're above what you were before with no interaction. And then as time goes on, you become less and less uh, mental well-being, whatever that is. So uh, so with that <laughs> yeah, said, I was wondering what the scale was for that one. Right. Uh, well, it's it's zero to 70, whatever that means. Uh, but I mean, look at this. So so the the graph changes on the weekends too so i'm i'm looking specifically at the video game one do you have this do you have this one op- open uh blake there i do okay so i'm looking at the video game one so the solid is the uh weekdays and then the dots are the weekends and look how far that is out right you peak at like 3 to 4 hours of engagement of video games on the weekends for your mental well-being <laughs> oh yeah, which is which is just kind of hilarious in some senses. That's that's still a pretty good chunk of time. Yeah, to like get an actual mental peak from it. Yeah, and I feel I feel that way too when I when I play. I'm like, no, I when I play, I want to devote a lot of time to this, and I want to make sure like I feel like I'm getting something done. Whereas one to two hours typically isn't enough for me. But on a weekday, I'm happy if I get one or two hours because it's still something. Now smartphones. Uh, looks really, really bad. I mean, you have like one hour um, is the peak, and then it like sharply declines. But I'm wondering though, like how do they how do they separate video games and smartphones? Because you can play video games on smartphones. That's a really good point. But I but still, I'm a I'm with you. There is such a sharp decline for using your smartphone that I I mean it's it makes me want to use it less while I'm out and about. That's for sure. Yeah, and I mean like. To, to just limit it to a smartphone, like, I don't know. Um, now I'm starting to question the methodology, right? So <laughs> how do you, but mm, I feel like social media should be its own category. And then I also feel like the type of interaction should be its own category, right? I, I don't know. The more I'm looking at this, the more I'm like, eh, I was sold on video games. And then the rest of them is kind of, uh, kind of doesn't feel like it belongs. Yeah, now movies. on smartphones, it feels like you could do all of these things. You can play exactly. video games. You can use a lot of applications you want on a computer. You can definitely watch TV and movies. So I yeah. don't know. Mm. It's like uh, those should be combined into surf the web or I don't know. I don't know. Look at look at stupid stuff on social media. Browse. Actually, browse uh, Human Factors Cast on social media. There we go. Yeah, that's one. Um, no, this is definitely a cool graph, and I encourage all of our listeners to go check it out. It is one of those ones that is like, wow, um, really kind of puts it into perspective for you. All right, Blake, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. All right. So 2017 has been interesting so far, and Ryan McReady from NextWeb thinks that 2017 will reject will reject some of the past graphic design trends completely. He put together a list of several design trends that, that he's been noticing this year, including louder and brighter colors, bold topography, hand-drawn graphics, and minimalism. The industry is always changing, and his guide might prepare you for those changes. Now, Nick, I looked through some of these, and I definitely have noticed them across the interfaces, or across a lot of different web applications, especially, like, the brighter colors and louder colors. But I was interested to see, like, what your take on his tips were. Yeah, no, it's uh, these are definitely trends that I've noticed, and... As somebody without the design eye, I was trying to get a designer to be on the show today, but uh, th- it's a holiday, and so obviously people are busy. But um, yeah, some of the some of the other ones that you didn't mention um, because they weren't in the show notes. That's okay. Uh, it's my bad. Minimalism. Uh, wait, we said minimalism, right? Uh, yep. But we Google, did. Google fonts and authentic pictures and useful gifts and duotones. 
So, um, yeah, no, I've definitely noticed all these design trends, and I don't know. I feel like I've seen some of these prior to this year. Like Dropbox has had the same hand-drawn designs for a long time. Yeah, that's for sure. I have seen like a serious resurgence of like authentic photos, especially if it's a specific company that you might recognize some of the people that are writing the blog if you like pay attention to their design tips or their coding tips. Uh, so they actually try and show people whether they, whether it's real or staged or not, but show people working during the process right. uh, at a specific company. So that's kind of cool. Gets you a little more immersed, makes you think you're getting an inside look. It's that human element. Yes, of our ever-changing so. digital world. <laughs> One of our taglines. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, this is uh, this is all very useful stuff. I love that the resurgence of GIFs are co- or GIF. I don't care how you say it. I say GIF. GIF. I say. Wait, what do I say? GIF. I yeah, say what GIF. Do you say? <laughs> I say GIF. I don't care how you say it. GIF is the wrong way. No, GIF is the right way. Whatever. I'm spending too much time on this. I love GIFs. They are amazing. Um, and uh, I always love it when, like, messengers have GIFs in them. Uh, <laughs> one of the people who I work with on a project just discovered them, and uh, we've been sending GIFs back and forth to each other. Anyway, uh, yeah, no, I've seen all of these, and um, he closes out by uh, saying, you know, some of, some of the old trends might go away. And, and man, I got to tell you, like, web design is just so volatile. It's always changing, and people are always finding different ways to do things. So I don't even know how long this list will go but if you are a designer looking for something out there that will uh help you stay on the cutting edge go check this out because they they point out a lot of really good successful sort of examples for you most definitely and if you happen to be a designer and employ any of these or have different ideas uh let nick and i know we'd love to hear about it or check out some of your stuff absolutely all right let's go ahead and move on to the next one all right so this one is uh is a little a little scary for me. But anyway, <laughs> so while it has traditionally been the task of front-end developers to transform the work of designers from raw graphical user interface mockups to actual source code, this trend might soon be a thing of the past, courtesy of AI. So Ulzar Technologies has leveraged the latest developments in the field of machine learning to build a neural network that once fed the raw screenshots of a graphical user interface proceeds to automatically generate code. This approach could potentially end the need for a manually programmed user interface. At the at present, the method generates code for code from screenshots with an impressive accuracy of over 77%, but the consistency of the algorithm is likely to improve in the future. The company knows the source code for the actual app will become available later this year, so make sure you follow them on GitHub on on their GitHub repository for more insights. Now Nick, for me this is both amazingly awesome and super bummer for me because I'm trying to get a little more into front end coding, <laughs> but still the fact that this is coming out and I we can jive into the details, but the fact that it's an algorithm it takes pictures, turns it into code that's like viable across three different code platforms is awesome. I love it. I love it uh, because it just breaks that additional step. Like when, once you have to hand something over the fence to developers as a human factors practitioner, it's painful, right? Because it comes back and it's a little bit different from what you wanted. And maybe it was like a, a limitation with the code or uh, maybe it was something else. But if you give this code to your developers and just say, here, hook everything up to this, then it's it facilitates that back and forth, right? Uh, where if you ever need to change it, all you have to do is go in and make the mock-up a little bit different and then go right back in and and uh, populate it that way. And then, you know, there's just a couple other bridges that have to be built. This is really fun to watch. Um, and by fun to watch, I mean he literally pops a picture into... Uh, into a command prompt and then it pops out this this HTML web page that you can actually interact with it is able to recognize buttons it's able to recognize uh, presumably drop downs and everything too um, although his his example was quite limited but in the future I'd imagine this is uh, that's where it's going but it's definitely one of those things that I'm just like yes this is one less step that we or, or one uh, one less barrier that we have between that communication between 
uh, HF folks and developers. Yeah, man, exactly. And it allows you guys to continually work on the problems that are at hand versus worrying about getting, because I mean, the HF practitioner or the UX designer, the UI designer put a lot of work into the getting a mock-up to where it needs to be, to be functional, better for the user, better for stakeholder objectives, and then having to give it to the developer for them to figure out, okay, this is what everybody wants. How do we get it together? I mean, that can even take away from them solving maybe more backend problems that are going on that are going to provide more functionality uh, at release or in the future. So it, it's almost there's this giant slowing down point in a lot of cases. So right. this really breaks a lot of barriers for that. It allows you to do what you're best at, trying to get user feedback integrated into a brand new system and allows developers to keep tackling the hard problems of back-end code and not having to worry as much about what's going on on the front side with, with apps like this. And yeah. I love that this is going to be dropped on GitHub, and that only means it's going to get better over time, probably a lot quicker um, than it would if it was released kind of only as an app. For sure. Yeah, this is my favorite story of this week. I mean, it's uh, it, it's it's just an example of how we can use AI to augment our jobs and not necessarily take our jobs. Because <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, let's be honest. No one can does like a, a computer can probably get a good idea of how to design for a human, but they'll never replace us. Come on. <laughs> no, and and you do make a really good point of uh, you know, there the developers also benefit from this because they're not going to be spending as much time on creating that front end, right? That's almost like our stuff and and we'll design the interfaces to use cognitive psychology and science and all that stuff. And then and then the developers come in and just hook up to what we've basically created. It's it's super cool. I love this article and I you can bet that I will keep a close eye on this. So if you see this coming up again in a couple of weeks when it's available, uh you're welcome. <laughs> All right. What what do we got up next? All right. So let's let's take the AI into the next realm. Okay. So a robotic police officer is making its debut on the streets of Dubai, and I hope everyone there has watched the movie RoboCop. The uniformed bot greeted visitors to the Gulf Information Security and Expo Conference after the conference wrapped up last Tuesday. It was deployed to the streets of Dubai. The robot rolls around on rolls around on wheels and it can salute, bow, and speak multiple languages and also recognize hand gestures from up to 1.5 meters away. It also has a tablet lodged into its chest which civilians can use to report crimes according to the Daily Mail. It was designed by the Dubai police with assistance from IBM's Watson and Google with an aim to assist and help people in the malls or or on the streets. The RoboCop is the latest smart addition to the force and has been designed to help fight crime, keep cities safe and improve happiness levels. Now, Nick, this is amazing that this thing's getting released onto the streets to uh, kind of monitor what's going on and allow people to report crimes right to it. He's not the superhero we want, but he's the superhero we deserve. <laughs> Precisely. He's a superhero that we built and put in Dubai. God. So, special shout out to Rosie the Robot, who tweeted at us when we posted this link. Rosie the Robot from the Jetsons, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're famous. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, this is uh, this is cool. I, I love it. I <laughs> I mean, there's a whole bunch of implications, right? Like, how do we how do we ensure that people won't be malicious towards this robot? How do we how do we ensure that you know, people aren't re reporting bogus crimes. And I'd imagine, you know, there's a suite of sensors on board that record all interactions with it. And, uh, you know, people will be punished and rewarded accordingly. But uh, now we have now we have RoboCops and it's this whole new frontier that we have to prepare for robotic peacekeepers. We have to adapt to this and sort of let them. Uh, play this role in our lives, right? And, and oh, man, there's so many ethical issues. Like, what if it makes the wrong call on something? And, you know, it's not right now. Right now, it's not making big, heavy calls, right? It's it's basically patrolling. Uh, it's a presence. Uh, to me, it's more of a statement of, like, we, we're putting these out there to sort of uh, establish 
uh, police presence in these areas, and if you happen to see a crime, you can report it through it. But I don't; it won't take action. But who knows in the future? And man, oh man, the ethical implications are there. Holy crap! Yeah, I mean, this is definitely a very big time first step because, like, like we've even covered before, when these were when a robot was l- released just to monitor a parking lot in the states. I mean, somebody attacked it immediately. Um, right. So who who knows how this will react? I think it's it's a good it's a good test. See what pe- see how people interact with it if they do it all reporting crimes to it, those kind of things. Really making sure that they emphasize to the public this is meant for like really small things, not not like some major crime. Like you're being mugged, you don't like want to not not call nine one one or the equivalent in your guns. country. But still, really awesome to see these being released. I feel like this is only the first step and we'll see a lot more of these in the future yeah all right so we got two more stories and i know you got a hard cut off soon so let's go ahead and move on to the next one all righty so the trb's national cooperative highway research program has released a brochure that summarizes its research in the field of connected and automated vehicles This resource explores how the trb is coordinating research to explore the legal societal operational and other impacts that connected and automated vehicle technology may have on transportation agencies and the traveling public. The brochure explores how the TRB is administering projects, issuing reports, and convening top-level leaders to address these emerging issues. Now, Nick, this has a lot of information in it, but what I thought that was most surprising to me was the legal aspect of it. And that's something I had not really thought about in terms of incorporating automated vehicles and how slow that process can be. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of legal stuff. Like who's at fault when it gets into a crash? If there's no driver operation, is it the company's fault for making faulty, you know, whose, whose liability is it basically? Um, This is uh, a really, cool cursory glance at what is going on they don't go into too much detail but they do give you just enough to go oh i want to know more about that and if any of our listeners are interested in automation and self self self-driving vehicles please go check out this report they have all the um all the codes the project codes for these as well as what they are and you can check up on those as well um you know so so just to give a an example of a few here we got like dedicated lanes for priority or exclusive use by um automated vehicles we have uh truck freight operations strategic communications machine vision and road markings that one's neat uh automation uh motor vehicle codes cybersecurity is a big issue Man, some of these, some of these, I just like, I want to go read more about, and I feel like we could spend an entire episode on this whole. Like, if we went and searched through all these, we could just spend an entire episode on this. So fascinating, for sure. I honestly, the article mentions it, and I think it's going to be the biggest kind of barrier to entry, or like the what might need the most focus is trying to make sure that the rules, the sensors, the changes to the environment are set in place for putting in automated vehicles that are going to be constantly operating while taking into account that some people just won't have them or, or won't adopt them immediately. And I think right. that's the, what's on the biggest or kind of the biggest thing up to bat for these guys. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when you said rules, I almost thought, are, are there going to be standardized logic that is, is a uh, legislative legislative logic that, all you know self-driving cars have to uh, uh adhere to like i hope not because that would mean it would move a whole lot slower and if there were bugs in the system then you'd have to get it passed through who knows what and oh my gosh i'm going down a rabbit hole but oh that's another serious concern right like how because if you at least have some sort of vetting process for logic then it makes sense but also it's really slow i don't know there's so much on this topic it really intimidates me <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the cybersecurity implications alone is Oh yeah. it's it, it's daunting. <laughs> oh yeah. All right. Uh, you want to end this thing? Yeah, let's uh you ready to go to 
let's change finish. our pace a little bit. Let yeah, let's let's finish off. This one's at least it's not cheerful, but it's not it's not going to get us down a rabbit hole. I don't think. Maybe a good. Ah, we'll find out. All right. So serving the London region, Gatwick Airport is the UK's second busiest airport after London Heathrow, and as you expect, it's a gargantuan place. Getting around its two massive terminals can be an absolute nightmare. To alleviate this, Gatwick has taken the unusual step of installing 2,000 Bluetooth-powered beacons that tell passengers where they are in the airport's two terminals. The first incarnation of the system shows travelers where they are on a digital map within their location, visualized as a blue dot. Gatwick eventually intends to introduce an augmented reality system that guides users with turn-by-turn directions using real-world visual data. Now, Nick, as per a lot of stories that we've read over the, I don't know, past few months, it feels like, once again, somewhere else is collecting data on you. Yep. (laughs) Wow, Blake. I was trying to make this one not suck, and you just totally just (laughs) made it all about... They got data on you. <laughs> but what I do love about this is I don't know if you've been to Gatwick Airport. Have you, Nick? I have not. Okay. When I went there a long time ago, I had gone on like two separate trips. It is vastly confusing about where to go. You're in a different country. In this case, you're in the UK. So the signs are not as big of a deal. You can You can kind of figure it out, but it's still a huge place. But I think applying these kind of like augmented to reality systems and gathering this data about where you are in an airport and where you need to be will be ultimately helpful for people that like to travel abroad or getting to a new place. And I mean, they, they even kind of talk about the secondary implications of gathering this kind of data. It's like, okay, if I know the flight you need to be on where you are in my airport right now, and you're going to be late, I can try and expedite that process, get you there quicker. Or if you're going to miss your plane, maybe I can send that data to your airline and get your bag off of the aircraft so you don't lose it potentially. So there's a lot of really great things for travelers that comes out of this. Right. Uh, But once again, (laughs) somebody else is holding on to data of yours. Well, I mean, look, man, we always talk about the trade-off of data. So you give them your data and they give you a service. That bag coming off the plane, that's a service. And then they also talk about potentially giving retailers access to this. So as you walk by Starbucks, you know, here's here's an advertisement for Starbucks and maybe a coupon because you're using their system. I don't know. It's it's a two-way street. So yeah, you give them their data, you give them your data. But also, well, Bluetooth is two-way, right? So yeah, I guess I guess they would have some personal information potentially, but there's probably ways to mask it to where you couldn't get targeted ads and they're probably just looking for like flow. So, who knows if it's anonymous or not? Uh that's to be determined, I guess. But the, the the thing that I took away from this that is really interesting to me is the queue management, right? So when you have um, – essentially what I what I equate this to is like imagine if Google Maps or, or um, Waze were to tell you which lane to get in because it's faster, right? That's kind of what I equate this to. Um, I guess you can – bump it up and tells you which streets to take because it's faster but that's kind of what i i equate this to right if you if you know there's a lot of people going through this direction it's going to be congested you're probably not going to be able to get there in time then it will route you through another way it's all really cool to me i actually uh, think it's great i mean uh if it helps you get through places you've never been or even like helps just helps you figure out are you going to miss your flight are you on time where you are in the process i don't know i eventually see this all kind of coming into like a google glass or within your glasses type of situation where it's just all this information is at your fingertips i mean the cost of getting that is you have to give give out your data and i think that's a worthy cause especially if it makes your life easier yeah i agree and i mean you know the future we'll we'll just have to see but again i think these things are you you trade your data for your services and well uh, the applications of this though we can we can go into a whole another time i think uh are you ready to wrap this thing up ready if you are my man all right let's do it that's going to be it for today everyone if you have any suggestions for topics or news stories that you want us to cover on the show you can go ahead and follow us over on the social medias Head on over to the Human Factors Cast, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. You can join the discussion on our SoundCloud or uh, send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. 
If you're really spicy, you can leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. You never know when we'll get to those. You can also support us on our Patreon site because, uh, you know, we bring these things to you ad-free because we love you at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast for as little as a dollar a month. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or your favorite podcast directory. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnsdorf for being on the show today. As always, where can our listeners find you? Always a pleasure to be on the show with you, Nick. And you guys can find me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it, it depends. depends on everything. On robot cops. Robocops. Airport navigation. Safety. Automatic cars.